it's important for everyone to understand the way of life, the way of the gospel. And through that, I'm going to share the way of the spirit. Now, I must add also that church history also can be a very contradicting topic. You know why? Because everyone tells it from their eyes. You understand what I'm saying? If I sat down in seminary and told you church history, I've read um, different histories from different churches, and I see that everyone has their own definition and idea. You understand? If you're talking to the Baptist, he will give you church history from his perspective. If you're talking about the Presbyterian, he'll give you church history from his perspective. If you're talking about the Congregationalist, he will give you history from his perspective. If you're talking about the Puritan, he will give you church history from his If you're talking about the Evangelical, he will give you your full gospel, Elim, full square. Regardless of where you are, depending on what you see, everyone has their own idea and mind of church history. Praise God. And some of them, of course, in the process, they end up, of course, history in the sense ends up biased. You understand? It, it gets biased. Why is it biased? Because sometimes it ends up presenting the agendas of them that teach it. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's also hard to find balanced church history. You understand? It's balanced. Hard to find balanced church history that is not biased and inclined to one direction of thought. Praise God. And I'm, tr I'm going to try as much as possible not to bias myself as I share this. Again, it's hard for any historian not to bias. <laughs> I want you to understand that I, I might also become guilty in the process. But it's hard for a anybody uh, reading history not to bias because, again, it's from the eyes you see it. Secondly, church history is so wide that no man will have the full pamphlet. You understand? And so there are things I might share that you know in church history that I've not touched. You, you get it? Add on to what I'm going to share. Are you hearing me? <laughs> Praise God. Um, but I'm going to share what I've seen, what I've read, how I've seen it, the things I've taken through. And for me, it took me more than eight years of studying this. And for me, they've defined a lot, and you will understand why. When you come to history, many of us, for example, when it comes to Uganda, and you say, how far do you go? in the history of the gospel in this land. Many of us do not go more than 50 years, all right, of something that has existed since the beginning of time. Thank God for the collected books that we carry and have as the Bible now, because those in part give us history of the earlier. But when you go after the cross, between after the cross to present, Many of us in that period are very blank. Yet everything we see here, everything we understand, everything we are right now is a definitive experience of what has happened within all of these past years. Praise God. And so what we labor to do, what we intend to do, what we try to do at the end of the day is to help someone appreciate and bridge that gap because at the end of the day, there are many questions and many mistakes. And again, as I read, you will see that every time history repeats itself, even as we continue to share, you will see that history is repeating itself. Sadly, in the repetition of history, we are not learning anything. And because we're not learning, many of us are susceptible to doing the same mistakes that history has done before. Praise God. Now, of course, Sometimes I would want to begin from when Jesus ascends to glory. Jesus, I will believe in this way, was not a threat to Rome, because Rome was one of the biggest empires that had ever lived. They had built systems, structures, they had built armies, they built everything that you know to run an empire. We all know. So I think Rome became an empire. It was the strongest empire that we all know in human history. Rome had everything. Rome had the army, Rome had the money, Rome had everything that you know. Right? 
Rome had said to take over lands and spaces and places that taken over the Jews. If you recall very well, even in the time of Jesus Christ, Rome was above the Jew. It, the Jew was a colony to Rome. You know that. They were big. They were big. And so because of that, the systems and structures of Rome are passed on either deliberately or not deliberately or directly or indirectly. Before you know that, whoever rules, right, runs the show. And so history has told us, and you all know, that when Jesus comes on the block, he's the average fellow. Now, to Rome, he is a simple individual, right? They don't even get it. You get it? Why? Because the challenge with Jesus is the, the Judaism, right? Because the way Judaism understands uh, the story and testimony of Jesus Christ, it believes in the Christ which will come to the end, but not the one walking in the flesh. And you all know that. And if you read the Judistic Creed, one of the most fundamental uh, lines there, or points or bullets there is that they believe that the greatest prophet that ever lived in history and still is, according to Judaism, is Moses. They believe in who Moses is and what he does and what he can do. You understand? And you see that that is the spirit of Antichrist. Antichrist, some people think Antichrist is just the spirit against the person of Christ. No, deeper than that, Antichrist is the spirit that seeks to take the place of the person of Christ. Sometimes it's not necessarily that it's against Christ, no, but it could even place a figure in the place of Christ. Yeah. But redemption does not come through Christ, but it comes through another. And with Judaism, redemption, salvation comes through Moses. You understand? And so they have a problem with this guy walking in the flesh saying he's the son of God and he's the Messiah. They don't believe that. They cannot relate with that. They can't connect with that, right? But with Rome, that's a small thing. Why? Because Rome doesn't even understand the customs of Judaism. They don't even know where these guys are coming from. So you just think, it's, you know, this is really up to you. You see how the Augustus is treat the fellow. You see how Pilate comes to the guy. He says, wait, are you the king of the Jews? You understand? Because he didn't get how this guy... No, no. Jesus tells the guy, if my kingdom was of this world, I, you know, my guys would be doing the things this world does. They would be fighting for space. And No, 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 no. Are you the king of the Jews? They don't get it. In fact, Pontius Pilate, the prefect of Judea, says, I find no fault in this man. They don't see anything wrong. They think, and some even think, no, he's just a plain fellow. He's just a confused guy who needs help. <laughs> you understand? Because how can he be the king? What is it take to king? At least you know church history. You know how kings become. They have to have a certain power, a certain authority, a certain strength, a certain army. How can you have, be a king without troops? How do you become a king? So I think no, it's just one of those confused guys, you know? And the story continues like that until the death and resurrection. And then he reveals himself to his own and then the ascension. And then he tells them to in Jerusalem until the spirits come. Many people don't know that the upper room experience was more than speaking in tongues. It opened another sanctum of what we will know later as church. And I'll explain why. These guys in the upper room, they're speaking, they're, you know, they're praying and the power of God comes on them. Yeah, clothing tongues of fire. They speak in tongues and men outside hear them speaking. Each man, right, in his own language. And they're like, what is happening? Okay, and then they gather to hear. As they were celebrating Pentecost, they pause their celebrations. They come to hear what is happening. And then Peter comes out, up square. And then as they have questions, he starts to speak. And for about 20 or 30 minutes of speaking, the Bible says, and their hearts were pierced. And they asked the man, what do you want us to do? More than we had known in church history, 3,000 men were standing before one man asking, what should we do? Imagine a Roman centurion is there. And this guy says, seize up every Roman here. Thank you. And they are asking, what do you want us to do? Do you want us to turn to somebody and kill them? Do you want us to run? What do you want us to do? Do you want us to jump? How high? Do you want us to scream? How loud? That was too much power. That was too much power on a man who did not have a sword, who did not have a shield, who did not have a spear and was not in armory. What was that to become then in future? 
What was the implication of that to Rome? That a man can speak for 20 minutes and win 3,000 people and you will have to go for war for days and walk many miles, eating nothing sometimes and then sleeping in the cold and waking up in the morning separated from your family to take over an area of 3,000 people. This fellow has taken over in just 30 minutes of speaking. That changes history. That changes history like you know it. That's a threat. Now the Bible says that same day, 3,000 guys were added. 3,000 in one day. What was the consequence of the gospel? You see them now shifting from Jerusalem. And then they go to Antioch where there was much teaching. And there at Antioch, the Bible says they were fastly called Christians. Why are they Christians? Some people think they were Christians only because they had a very wonderful moral life. That's not enough to warrant someone to be like Christ. Dalai Lama is not Christ. Mother Teresa is not Christ. God bless her soul. It's more than that. Are you following what I'm saying? But there was something more distinctive. And this was that these guys were living every life the way you'd see Christ. I mean, cooks were making the lame walk. You understand the opening blind eyes on the deaf. You understand? Philip, you know Philip, you know Stephanus. You understand he was the man who was serving the tables. But then he goes to the market to buy groceries and then he says, who is blind, who is deaf, who can't hear? You get it? That was a threat. And then they say, oh, no, 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 no. These guys are like that. Of course, multiplication started to come through. And what looked like was a normal, normal, normal life of Christianity, it turned into a big threat in Rome. Now, what will the Romans do? What should the Romans do? Let us destroy this move. Typical humanistic politics. Right? Let us destroy this move. What do we do? Let's first deal with the ring leaders. Who are the leaders of the movement? And if you have read history, you realize that almost all the apostles were killed. Somewhere, somehow. Paul was decapitated. Peter was hung upside down. You've had stories. Praise God. And they were killed. But you kill the ring leaders, and the gospel continues. So what's the other thing you have to do? False accusations. Right? And then they start labeling the church many things because they know that the church, if labeled a certain way, it will lose a certain reputation. And I want you to follow these things because they're happening even in present day. And what happened? They accused them of incest. Why incest? Because you are now learning a new language in the kingdom where all brothers and sisters, we are children of the Most High, and then a Roman guy finds you on the road and you tell him this is sister. Sure. Huh, he has a beautiful sister. Praise God. And then one day, <laughs> they hear you're married. And they're like, wait. <laughs> he married the sister. That's incest, you see. And they say, oh no, Christians are incestuous. And then you have experiences. It's probably someday you're worshipping and then these guys are supervising and the guy is walking through the door and then the window and then he's hearing somebody take my body my blood drink it eat it you understand now the guy outside what do you think he's thinking <laughs> yeah you eat people praise god yeah so they're cannibalists but again remember as they are separated by the anointing and the grace of god they start to sense in their souls that they cannot continue in pagan worship of the Greek and Roman gods. And before you know that, they are not, they are not social. They are anti-social. They are not friendly people. And I don't know whether some of you have heard in history of an emperor called Nero. Yes, if you have. And then this fellow, he's tried everything. They've tried everything and they can't. What does he do? He gets an idea. <laughs> you understand? And history tells you he set Rome on fire. Right? And that fire burned for nine days. Burned almost a third of Rome. Now historians tell you it was a deliberate way to accuse the Christians enough so at least this was enough to get them destroyed. Because all accusations had come through and then failed to hold water. And historians say that he was playing the violin that night. 
when Rome was burning. Hence the common idiom. I don't know that some of you have heard it, fiddling while Rome burns. You've heard it? Anyone has heard of that thing? Fiddling while Rome burns. It's the idiom that means that you are playing or doing something unserious when a very serious occasion is happening. So it is believed in history that he was playing his violin while Rome was burning. Then after that he said Christians had done it. What happens? That became the biggest, one of the biggest persecutions of the church in history. How could they burn a third of Rome? You know, the spirit of religion glories in the institution, not the substance and message. You know that. They would die for it. That's why if you remember when they were accusing Jesus Christ, they said he has spoken blasphemies against the temple. They, they are very protective about the building, very protective about everything erected in the name of their faith. You understand? Do anything touching the tradition, do anything touching the institutional, do anything touching the leadership, religion will come on you. Anything that threatens the leader, their institution and building, or their tradition, they'll come on you. That's the thing religion protects. Then protect the name, then protect the person. I mean, then protect the person of Jesus Christ, then protect the gospel. It would die and protect those things. And as I continue sharing, you will see examples of many uh, events of such, of, of, of such experience. Again, because history repeats itself. So, from that time on, all through from 1 AD, all through the persecution of the church begins. History tells us more than 10 emperors from Nero to Diocletian. All of those dispensations persecuted the church. In fact, on the day when Rome was burned, they said they gathered them and put them together in heaps and they burnt them. They brought wild animals to maul them in amphitheaters and they enjoyed the show. Because these people had touched Rome, they took some in front of gladiators and they started playing with them and killing them before all men and everyone was clapping. Why? Because these are the people that had touched the glory of Rome. Nero didn't die. He continued living. Praise God. That looked like one of the worst experiences. If a man had lived in that time, they would ask God many questions. Why? Your leader, Jesus Christ, is dead. The apostolic voices are dead. And now you're under the persecution of Roman rule and there is no hand and no power out there to help you. How would the man believe in those days except they had believed, received God with an experience? Except they had not simply entered the life of Christianity on debate and, and cheap talk, but they really had a personal relationship with God. Fast forward, as usual, wars ensued. Wars ensue, and then the Jews start fighting Romans. By 70 AD, 68 AD, the worst war happens into 70 AD, where Israel is besieged, and the Jews lose Israel. Sorry, Jerusalem. So when the Jews lose Jerusalem and they are thrown up into the mountain, Israel is not a nation anymore like we know it. Because Jerusalem is seized. It's our mother. <laughs> It's where we all hold our history from. Anybody that professes the faith. Prophecy and everything within points to that great city. And by that time, the Romans took over. And it was no more. It was no more. It was no more like we know it. So we begin now from there. Praise God. We begin from there, about 70 AD. Now, the, persecution is, the persecutions were there, like I said, and continued for the real faith. But also, one distinctive mark of that time, the more they were persecuted, history tells you the gospel continued to spread. Because there are people who are sympathetic with the Christian faith. And every time the Christians would come and share their testimony, the love of God, the forgiveness of sins. That's why we call it irresistible grace. 
you can't hear God. It doesn't matter how much you are threatened, how much they are willing to do to you. You cannot hear God a certain way. They cannot present God a certain way and you deny him. You can't. Are you following what I'm saying? Because he's irresistible. Love draws. Corinthians 13, 8. That love never what? Never fails. Praise God. So there was a faithfulness. But I also want to introduce to you a very interesting concept. It's called the Catholic Church. Now, then we start to understand that's the beginning. That period is the beginning of us defining the Catholic Church. Catholic, the word Catholic means universal. Are you following what I'm saying? It means what? Universal. The first group that claimed to be, to draw this universal church, they believed in the unity of the faith and in the knowledge of the Son until we will be mature, right? The Bible says we cannot carry certain maturity when we don't believe in the unity of the faith. And so these fellows believed in the unity of the faith. Don't confuse it with what later became the Roman Catholic. I'll explain that. Those are two different entities. The original one simply believed in the unity of the faith that would take them into the knowledge of the Son and to a perfect man, to the measure and station of the fullness of Christ. Are you following me? And so, because they are coming together, they are persecuted, it's true. They are burnt, it's true. They are martyred, it's true. But the church is growing. And more people are earning certain positions in the faithful. Right? I don't know that some of you have heard of a guy they used to call Polycarp. Right? You've heard of him. Wow. Why am I even teaching? <laughs> now they open war on forcing men to renounce Christ. Right? They open war on forcing men to renounce Christ. Polycarp comes through one time. They tell him, we're going to kill you if you don't renounce Christ. Polycarp makes the very strong statements that have imbued the church history till present. He says, this far, my Lord has been faithful to me. How can I renounce him now? You understand? Wow. They killed a the fellow. But you see, many were killed that way. Many, many were killed that way. But the church was growing stronger. And then the church feels there's a necessity for unity, for us to come as one. The universality that brings us together because we have the same faith. Everybody else outside is killing us. How do we get this group for us together and just make sure that, you know, as a collective effort, we could do something? And that's how it comes through. But then when they come through, right, in connecting and relating and working with each other, another question comes through. As they come together, they all start to realize that many of them have, like many of us in this room, like the world does, everyone had their own idea about Jesus. Again, from the angle they had heard about Jesus. So that was the age also that helps us formulate what we call truth. What is truth? Primarily, who is Jesus Christ? Because everyone sees him a certain way. Everyone understands him a certain way. The next three or four hundred years were very, very interesting days in defining AD, right? There were very, very many interesting experiences, and I'll share quite a, some of them, that were there to help us understand, help them understand. At least if we are all together believing in Jesus Christ, who is the Jesus? Who is Jesus Christ? How do we draw the standard of truth? Because you know your truth. You have the only definition of truth. How do we relate with this? And the earlier Catholic church fathers form what you and I learned back in the day as the Apostles' Creed. How many of you have heard of it? Praise God. And I wrote it down. I got it for you so that you hear it. Hmm? Yeah? When you listen to this creed, because it was given to us in a religious understanding, I was biased. Right? But when I grew up and read it, I understood why they needed to draw the standard of which Jesus they were defining. 
And this is what it says. It says, I believe in God the Father Almighty. Do you? And in Christ Jesus, his only son, our Lord. That Jesus who was born from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, who under Pontius Pilate was crucified and buried, and on the third day again rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, sits at the right hand of the Father, where he will come to judge the living and the dead, and in the Holy Spirit. And he said that I believe in the Holy Church. Some say Catholic, but originally it was the Holy Church. And they said we believe in the remission of sins. And they said we believe in the resurrection of the flesh. And he says, and life what? Everlasting. Do you believe that? That was a standard. Praise God. That was what? That was a standard. That was a standard. That was a standard. And so, now we have a f one unifying factor. If you believe in these above, that's the same Jesus you and I are talking about. If anybody brings any other crap except this one, we don't know them. You understand? That period also was a very definitive period of helping in the collection of what we now call the Bible. The canonization. You understand? But I'll come to that a bit later. The first, I'm talking about the first 300 years. The most remarkable things for you to note in that time. Because I can't go now and now go and he did this and then this one killed this one and then the other one was the brother of this one. I don't have all that time. But it's important for you to, to note the few things that all of us, at least every theologian will agree with me. Praise God. Now, because of that, we now need to understand what are the things we can collect. Of course, some of the letters were there. The Pauline letters were still in existence. They were still fresh. Some works were available. And many, many, many things they had to choose from. We believe in that time that they had received the person of Jesus Christ. But why, even though we have Jesus, are we seeking now to collect something to bring us together as truth and standard of the Christian faith? Because during that time, a number of heretics started to come through. Yes, they believe in Jesus, but then certain experiences come through and then they get certain revelations <laughs> and interpretations of the story. And sometimes they are not wrong with the person of Christ per se but they are confused in some matters concerning the faith. Are you following what I'm saying? And I'll come later to that again when we're dealing with a few creeds in orthodoxy. I'll read for you only two fellows that interest me. One guy was called Marcion of Sinope. He lived between 85 to 100 AD, 160 AD. Marcion of Sinope said, the Old Testament was an erroneous view of God. Why? Because it says the Old Testament defined God as a God of wrath. So it says that was a wrong view of God. Now, what Marcion of Sinopis does, he says, no, let's get rid of it. It shouldn't be taught, it shouldn't be touched, it shouldn't even be had. Kill it, burn it. And he said, I believe in only the Jesus and the gospel of the New Testament. And specifically, he says, Paul, the grace of God and his mercy. And then he says, Christianity, let us all divorce ourselves from the Old Testament. Now, some people, even in present truth, don't connect to the Old Testament at all. Because they don't see Christ in the Old Testament. You understand? They don't see Jesus in the Old Testament. They see a God of wrath, seeking justice, killing people, ground swallowing, fire coming from heaven, consuming them. You understand? And, and with Marcion, when he sees that, he says, uh-uh. When he sees the God of love and mercy and through Paul and the grace of God preached, he says, uh-uh, let's get rid of that. Now, there's a bigger problem because you're destroying a very important and integral part of history. We need the Old Testament. Jesus tells his disciples after the resurrection, he says, and beginning from Moses, he expounded the things concerning himself. I think what Matthew and some of us have not seen is 
Matthew did not see the work and move and person of Jesus Christ because he was hidden in the pages of the Old Testament. What Matthew saw was only the anger and wrath of God, but he didn't see the bigger picture and where God was taking them. You don't blame him. God needed to go to Abraham. The Bible says in the scriptures for us seeing that God would justify the Gentiles through faith. He went afore and preached this gospel to Abraham saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. It's the only way the Jew can understand that God did not only come for the Jew, but he also came for the Gentile. And he says, like the scriptures tell us, And your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and he was glad. He needed to go to some of these men. Jesus needed to reveal himself to them. He was the rock from which they drank. He was the cloud by day and the fire by night. He was hidden in pieces and ways. He was hidden in things that were not directly interpreted, but he existed. So Marcion could not see that the law was a schoolmaster leading men to Christ. He saw it as an enmity, and that was not the God, and so let's denounce the Old Testament. And then these men, the teachings continue moving through and going through. In that same period, a couple of, one or two hundred years later, as the confusions were in the church, there was a need to canonize the Old Testament. What does it mean to canonize the Old Testament? To define as sacred and divine and rightful for men to regard as truth and teaching and instruction in the way of God. So these, what they used to do back in the day when there was a question that used to bring challenges in the church, they used to get the church fathers, right? There were some, later you'll hear, they were called the nascent fathers, and then there were those which were before the nascent Fathers, they were called the antenation, but they used to get a bunch of men. They used to get men of God and men of substance, ministers of substance, and then they'll get together and then say, what do we do about this? How do we relate with this? How do we do that? So, of course, then the church was small enough again and again in some order enough to get certain people. <laughs> it was so hard in this time. You can't call the top shots of town. And then you tell them, come and let us de talk about this doctrine that has come in Kampala. It's not possible. They would not turn up. You'd need to drive to many of their homes. <laughs> Praise God. The other interesting fellow that I find very funny was a guy called Montanus of Phrygia. Montanus claimed Jesus and all the prophets appointed him in the place of the Holy Spirit. Right? He said he got a vision and a revelation that all the prophets and the person of Jesus appointed him as the Holy Spirit, the helper, right? But also in that confusion, deeper in there, he's saying, as you see, he believes in me. I am the physical representation and I am the only representation of the person of the Holy Spirit. And then before we know that, he, man, I think there's another fellow you'll read about called Alicibiades. They started to have extra biblical prophetic, um, extra biblical uh, prophetic instructions, things that were not in scripture, could not be backed by the word of God, and all of them were in the name of the Lord has showed me. You understand? You know, when you have not understood how God works, the prophetic can be very, very, very destructive. Very, very, very destructive. Very, very, very destructive. Very, very destructive. And so, we see a time when now this leads men to canonize the New Testament. Why are they canonizing the New Testament? To say, look, this is the standard teaching of the New Testament and the books thereof. Right? This is what we believe. So they have to compare letters and notes and say, can we take this? Should we take this? What is the reason behind why we should take this? What is the reason why we shouldn't take this? Why should we believe this book? Why shouldn't we take this book? But also, uh, uh, Moses, uh, Simon wrote a revelation. But you see, there's a shepherd of Amos. Da, 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 da. All of them are writing about the present truth. Why aren't we taking this? So there was a huge debate in there by the fourth century. 
they had a standard of what they believed, our fathers believed, that I think this is something that we can standardize and say, this is the New Testament, nothing more, nothing less. Some people think it was done just to hold people from deeper knowledge, no, but it was done to help people who could go off the face easily because they were not stable enough to design many things. And mark you, back in the day, not many people had access and ability to read. The reading of the word was given to a few special people. You understand what I'm saying? But also in that time also, in that period, came what we call the arise of the bishop, the office, and this whole idea you and I call what? Bishop. If you go back in the early times of church, what you read in Paul's day are elders, pastors, deacons. Those are the things you find in Pauline letters. You understand? But then, what happens is, they started to create a system that was exactly like Rome. And I'm going to come to that. Why? Because in the time of persecution, the only way some Christians felt was easier to be understood was to structure themselves and formalize themselves in the structure and system of Rome because if they are like Rome, then they are easily predictable. Because the Romans didn't even know how these, um, these, uh, how, how is their leadership like? Because back in the day, leadership was only um, circling around the local church. You had elders, you had pastors, you had deacons. That was it. Then Rome is different. But I also need you to understand that the foundation of Rome as a system was many things and many gods. Rome as a structure and system, and I want you to understand this, was Greek philosophy, huh? Greek mythology, Egyptian mythology, and the Persian Zoroaster gods. That was the foundation. What the Romans used to do, whatever each god would teach by tradition, and they find applicable, they will bring into the fold in building what we call the Roman structure and system. There are many, many, many things. Again, I will offend, eh? but understand me, history has told us these many things. Okay? I, I don't know how not to offend, but some of the positions that we hear in present-day church, many of them are Rome. Many of them are Rome. Right? There's a reason why the man of God and Romac is not a bishop, yet he has been in the gospel for 50 years. Right now he should be a no. <laughs> Patriotic <laughs> Are you following what I'm saying? <laughs> Praise God. But then we have an experience where the bishop thing comes through. Why? They started to hold it over Rome. Like you see the Roman Empire, they started to build the church in the structures, the patriarchs, the archbishops, the bishops, or the priests. So who watches over the area, right? The bishop. Who watches over the cities, collected group of cities, the archbishop. Who watches over that one? And the whole leadership. The patriarch, the so called patriarchs. Then we we are coming into the idea of the papacy. We are coming later into the idea of the papacy. But you see how it's starting to shape up. So you have bishops here, you have bishops there, you know. Um, and then in that same period, because of the power that is given to these bishops, right, and that bishops and leaders then that are ordained in the church many of them were given too much power in the process. And that is why also challenges have come in position. Because once you are in position or in a, an authority, if you don't look at the responsibility given, you will look to take advantage of the privilege of the power given. 
and that's exactly what happens to the place where later you see them even able to forgive sin i'm going to come to that later i've forgiven you never do it god do this god do that you understand it's bathing and building slowly in fact in the next session we're going to now enter into the place of the apologetics into the papacy right and how it comes through but then most importantly what i want you to see there were thoughts in the time of persecution and i want to ask that question in the time of persecution what this people would do, these emperors would do, they would persecute, kill you, put you, burn you on stake, do whatever it has to be, and then they give you conditions of renouncing Christ. They can even tie you in bundles and start the fire and say renounce. Right? Now another question arises in that time. Huh? Now these people who have renounced Christ because they are persecuted, do we allow them back in the church? Or don't we allow them back in the church? Okay, what does the Bible say? Uh -huh. If you deny me before my father, I will also what? <laughs> so, now that's the question. That's what brings the idea of Novation and Cornelius. Right? Novation and Cornelius. These were the two debates in that time. Novation says, you know what? <laughs> we can't allow them back. Why should we allow them back? How can you denounce Jesus? You understand? And then Cornelius says, no, we can have them back, but with acts of penitence. Because if we take them to the bishop, during that time, the bishop has power to forgive sin. Now, there are two problems, but they are one and the same. You understand? And in fact, when the debate ensued, Cornelius won. And novation, the novation idea was thrown away. You understand? In the name of, we have to give grace. But instead, grace was taken from the person of Jesus Christ. And it was extended to the bishop who had the power to forgive sins. And that's where we also in the, now the beginning of what we call acts of penance. Right? Things you have to do to prove that you are, you are sorry. You understand what I'm saying? Can you sweep the whole building? If the bishop feels that you have to sweep the whole building, we can forgive you. You understand what I'm saying? If the bishop feels that you, you can dig his garden and he forgives you, you're forgiven. Even before the papacy, the bishops were given power to what? To forgive sins. Of course. It is a hard thing if you think about it, remove the bishops and for a moment think as I close. Should this person really be allowed back? Because it means he doesn't believe in Jesus Christ. Right? Of course we are considering the hundreds that have died and said you'd rather kill me. Now, what respect does he have for the dead? That coward. You see what I'm saying? You cannot know that a man understands grace until you put pressure on them. Hey! On us. I'm speaking about us. You understand? <laughs> You're speaking the gospel of grace until <laughs> somebody rubs you the wrong way. And then you say, how could he do this? Eh? I have to, you see, but you are ministers of <laughs> grace. 